Welcome, everyone. Bonjour, Shabab Nell. Martin, nice to see you. Hi. And Jacques nice from Canada, you. excellent. So those who, if you show your face, then you might get called out. <laughs> oh, Sepate, nice to see you. We have Fede Congo as well with us. Maybe uh, Daniel or one of his colleagues. Bonjour. Bonjour, feel, Daniel. Feel free to open your cameras, write me your names and centers and country as always. Ah, I've, I've seen Daniel. Uh, and I can see Edel from Mag Philippines as well. Oh, and I can see Someone great that I got to meet from the CR Center in Spain, Mamadou Simaka, who's a new staff member um, with lived experience and who's going to be doing community work with CR Spain. So we've got a lot of cool people in this call from all around the world. Exactly. Global perspective. And Lenin, welcome from India. Hi, Delaria. Thank you, thank you. Also from UK. And Robin from Australia. Here we go. We span the globe, this, this crew. Super nice. Chabonel, comment ça va? Mamadou. Hey, Robin. Nice to see you. She gets the prize. It's mi it is midnight, correct? Pardon? Not yet, but it will be before we get to the end. <laughs> we have colleagues online, and it's like almost midnight. We have colleagues online, and it's five a.m. This is dedication, and this is really a uh, fantastic. So we have a good crew, and the question is if we should kick off. All right, I'm going to uh, greet you all. My name is Lisa, Lisa Henry. I sit in the IRCT Secretariat. We are based in Copenhagen, Denmark for historical reasons. Um, we are spanning the globe with this global membership of IRCT, which is always a pleasure to talk about over 160 members in 76 countries. Um, and I couldn't think of a better day to have the theme of survivor engagement and models for using survivor engagement as we approach June 26th, very rapidly, where I know a lot of you in your centers around the world will be focusing on survivor voices, survivor stories, the evidence survivors have of their lived experience, um, and the impact that being able to speak out uh, to speak your truth, to influence decision makers, policy makers, etc., is an intrinsic part of the healing journey. And that's what we're here to celebrate today. Um, as always in this great organization, it is the members who are on the front lines and you as staff in the member organizations who are really, you know, 24 seven working with this theme. Um, many of you would have survivors on maybe decision making bodies of your organization your governing boards, they can be advisory, they can be part of your staff. Um, survivors are obviously clients, they can be community members, um, they can be influencing the, the rehabilitation journey as psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers on your team. So we're here to celebrate that and we're here to understand more of a model that has been used by the Torture Abolition and Survivors Support Coalition in Washington, DC. Uh, commonly referred to as TESS. Um, they have worked with this model for some years. They're going to be explaining it today. And the model is all about how can we, in the rehabilitation journey, coach, encourage, and work with survivors to be able to tell their story in a way that can be part of the rehabilitation journey, but also part of their storytelling to decision makers, 
How do you prepare people to do that? How can you help guide them in telling the important parts of their story in a succinct way? Because we know sometimes decision makers and the rest of us might not have the enormous amount of time it would take to tell the full story. So we'll learn some great tips from Tess who's been doing this successfully for many years. Uh, and I can't help but think about my most recent trip to the Philippines where you met an 18 year old person who had just been tortured in police detention with new methods of electrocution and his desire also to speak about this. And I'm thinking about how would you have worked with this person, both in the rehabilitation journey, but his desire to speak about this. How do we coach to do this successfully, safely, um, so survivors have that agency again? With those words, I'd like to celebrate all of you who took the time to join us today, who prioritize this, and hope very much uh, through your membership in RCT that you will be growing and learning more and being able to do more of this work with survivors as you move forward in your organizations, learning from each other. So welcome. And um, I'm going to hand it over now to the facilitator of this meeting and moderator. But before that, a few words from Carmen, who's working with us as Focal Point and the Project Associate for Survivor Engagement at IRCT. Carmen, over to you. Thank you. I'm just going to do the housekeeping very briefly. This is a reminder that you have interpretation, hay interpretación, so you can hear this in English, Spanish, and French. This is a reminder also for the speakers to speak at a pace that the interpreters can easily understand. And if there is anyone that's going to participate in the questions later on, same message. And uh, ultimately, uh, there will be a pop-up survey before we leave that will take a couple of seconds. And without further delay, I will give the floor to Andrea Baron from Task, who will introduce herself and then the rest of the speakers. I hope you all enjoy. Okay, hi everyone. So I'm Andrea Barron. I'm the Advocacy Program Manager at Task, And I'm gonna just tell you who we're gonna be hearing from and then I'm gonna share my screen. Um, so we're gonna, after I'm gonna be speaking for around 15 minutes to tell you about the issues that our survivors care the most about and a little background about TAS. And then we're gonna hear from uh, Eamon Tabir, who has the Stand for Sudan sign in the back of his head. <laughs> he is our executive director, originally from Sudan. He's gonna speak for about five minutes. Then we're gonna hear from Annie Couture Newton, who is a psychotherapist at Northern Virginia Family Service, also an IRCT member, who's our advocacy consultant, who's gonna speak from the point of view of a therapist. And then I'm gonna speak again about the how-to. Uh, and then we're gonna hear, I'm gonna pose some questions to our three survivors, Jakob Hagos and Charles Fortunben and Desire Lamupa. So I don't know where they are on your screen, but they're on my screen. So, okay, so now I am gonna share my screen and one second. Here we go. Okay, so um, TASC was founded in 1998 by Sister Diana Ortiz. She was a nun, originally from American nun from New Mexico, raped by the Guatemalan military in 1989. And I don't know how many people we have here from Latin America, but um, this was during the years of the Central American Wars, uh, where our country, the United States, was supporting right wing dictatorships in Guatemala and in other countries in Central America. Over 200,000 Guatemalans were killed or forcibly disappeared. Our mission is to end the practice of torture and also empower survivors. So I obviously cannot and neither can task end torture everywhere in the world, but we try to prevent it. And, but we definitely can empower survivors themselves and their families. And we do that every single day. So I'm the uh, advocacy program manager. My background is in international politics. Um, so, uh, and advocacy, before I came to task, I also worked in advocacy. The two big issues that our survivors care about 
are talking about human rights abuses in their countries. Nine, over 95% of our survivors are African, are from Africa. So obviously that's what we talk about because that's what they care about. And US asylum policy, that part is gonna get a little complicated, but it's really important that people understand what it is. Then I'm gonna talk about how do we choose our advocacy issues, our capacity. I'm the advocacy program manager. I don't have any staff, there's just me and my two wonderful interns who are here during the summer. Okay, so um, here we go. Um, why do survivors want to share their stories with Congress? They're mostly from Ethiopia, Cameroon, and Eritrea. Um, and that is because they want other people in the world, like policymakers, to know about the horrendous human rights violations and torture in their countries and I would and they want to stop it from happening to other people that is kind of what it is on that issue they want to continue their advocacy they were political or they took political acts uh, in their country and they don't want other people to suffer how they suffered so that's their main motivation um, so we're gonna we focus a lot in Ethiopia. We actually don't have an Ethiopian survivor here today, but that's because over 70% of TAS survivors are from Ethiopia. We have uh, Jacob today, who is from Eritrea, uh, and he's gonna tell you how he was the survivor tortured because he refused to spy on his customers in his internet cafe. So our survivors are heroes. Jacob could have agreed with the Eritrean government, spied on his customers, and nothing would have happened to him and he wouldn't have been tortured. And he would have been perfectly fine with his kids and his wife, but they stand up for justice and freedom. Um, and that's why they're suffering. Cameroon, we have survivors who are Francophones, French speakers who criticize the dictatorship of Paul Bia and Anglophones oppressed by the French dominated government. And we have LGBT and allies of the LGBT population who were persecuted because of their sexual orientation um, so people like many of us, including me, who is an ally of the LGBT population, nothing can happen to me. But if you're an ally of the LGBT population in a country like Cameroon or Uganda, where we do have cases like this, they themselves were tortured because they were allies of this community. Okay, so here is um, some of the work we've done. This is one of our big successes. We passed a resolution in 2018 called House Resolution 128 on Ethiopia. And on the left is uh, a, a great, one of our great pictures. That's me sitting down, kind of wearing something blue uh, next to Guya Deki, who is, um, he is one of our survivors, contracted polio as a child. He's sitting in a wheelchair. He refused to go along with the dictatorship in Ethiopia. He was tortured and thrown into a forest by government agents who thought the hyenas were gonna eat him. And this is how he survived. He's a smoker. Can you imagine smoking would save your life? But after he was thrown into the forest, because he's a smoker, he lit a fire. People saw him, rescued him, and that's how his life was saved. So smoking can save your life. Um, and then we have two congressmen in that photo. Doesn't matter who they are, but they actually are Republicans. So they are Republican congressmen who are standing up for torture survivors. Um, and then below that is House Resolution 128. So this is important for us because we have proof that our survivors convinced 25 members of Congress to sign the bipartisan resolution. Um, and unfortunately, Right now, the situation is deteriorated in Ethiopia. We're not happy about what's happening, but this still was a big success for us. This is a direct quote from one of our survivors um, who happens to be from Ethiopia. And he tell, told us that he wants to talk about what happened to him there. Ethiopia, terrible things are still happening. And he said, speaking out at these meetings <clears throat> helped decrease my depression, relieve my trauma. My voice has become more powerful and I feel stronger because of my advocacy. And he wants to encourage other survivors 
to become involved. So um, let me, I want to be kind of clear that we're not operating the advocacy department. We're glad that survivors can feel, go through the healing process. But what we get, how we get them involved is I, we don't say we want you to go and visit Congress like we will do on June 26th and 27th for June Survivors Week so you, for you can heal. We say we want you to go to help focus on the issues you care about, which is human rights abuses in your country, torture in general, and asylum. And as a result of that, healing becomes part of it, but that's not what we're pushing for. And that's, that's the, that is work for us. Okay, so here I'm gonna take a minute and let everyone just read this over before I talk about it. It's a little bit complicated. So I'm just gonna pause for a minute and let everyone read what this story is. Maybe the interpreters can read this in Spanish and uh, French. Okay, so um, we know asylum is different in every country, but this is our big campaign right now. So I did want to explain about this. Desire is going to be giving more details because he is one of these affirmative asylum seekers who has not gotten asylum. So people who enter the US with a visa apply for something called affirmative asylum. And that word affirmative is really important. People who cross the US-Mexican border without a visa are, apply for what's called defensive asylum. The reason we focus on affirmative asylum seekers is that's because that's who most of our survivors are. Jacob entered as an affirmative asylum seeker. Charles entered as a defensive asylum seeker. So again, this is responding to who our survivors are and what they care about. So, Many of these affirmative asylum seekers, like Desire, who's going to speak to you today, have waited six, seven, or eight years for an interview with an asylum officer. The organization, the agency in charge of this is called USCIS. And I always tell everyone it's really amazing coincidence that the headquarters for the entire country of USCIS happens to be a five minute walk from my house. So I get to see this organization that is responsible for the suffering of so many of our survivors many times because it's right next to my house practically, which is really interesting. So the big issue for us, for the survivors is to get an interview. Most of our survivors, once they get an interview, they are granted asylum. A few of them are referred to the immigration court, like Jacob, and he got asylum from the court. But the big struggle is getting the interview. So what happened is this organism, this agency, will not interview affirmative asylum seekers who entered before 2018. It seems like totally ridiculous, but it's like one of our survivors told me, you're standing in the grocery store waiting to buy your groceries that you need to survive. And someone keeps letting other people jump in front of you. And you keep getting put further and further back in the line. And it will never be your turn. You will not get a turn. It's only everybody else in front of you. So this USCIS is prioritizing the people who cross the border ahead of people waiting six or seven years. And I'll give you a good example. You'll see a picture of this man later. So we refer, of course, to survivors by their full names and their country when they give us permission to do so. So you can just assume if I'm going to be talking about 
Alex from Russia that he already gave me permission to talk about him and his story. So Alex from Russia is a gay man from Russia, now living in New York City. You will see a picture of him a little later. He has been waiting seven years for an asylum interview. He has two Russian friends, also gay men, who crossed the border, the US-Mexican border, and it took them 10 months and they already got granted asylum. They're gay men from Russia, just like him. 10 months, they got asylum. He's waiting seven years, he cannot get an interview. That's a clear case of what we see as an injustice. And we see, we say this is in, unfair, inhumane, inefficient. So our campaign for asylum justice is about getting interviews for these asylum seekers. So it's not, we're not saying to USCIS, you must grant them asylum. We're saying they have a right to present their case. So I hope that's not terribly complicated, but okay. So here is um, one of our survivors. This is not his real name. This is our demonstration in front of the White House. That's that big fence that you see in the picture is the fence that's in front of the White House. And um, so he's, we also, as part of our campaign, we've had demonstrations in front of the White House. And he says, I attended the demonstrations in front of the White House and the asylum office. He's waiting seven years from an interview. He is an LGBT ally. He comes from Cameroon. He was tortured because he supports human rights for all Cameroonians. In this case, it was for the LGBT community. He is a married man with a wife and six children, but he's supporting the LGBT community. So he was attacked, lost consciousness, could have died, ended up in the hospital. Then he was attacked later for attending the funeral of someone in his organization. And that's when he fled Cameroon. And he has been waiting seven years, more than that, for an interview. So this is someone like many of our survivors. You're supposed to get asylum if you can prove a well-founded fear of future persecution because of your race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. So he is a clear case of someone who would get asylum if he ever got an interview, but they will not give him an interview. Okay, oops. Oh, okay. This is my second part. So I think now we're going to go on to Eamon. I'm going to stop sharing the screen. And Eamon, do you want to go ahead, please? Eamon is my boss, so I'm asking him to very politely if he'll go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. I just want to check with Annie because she was a little bit uh, short on the time. Annie, you want to go first or you still have time? Eamon, you're right. Thank you. Thank you. Annie, why don't you go first? Because she has to finish by 930. Thank you, Eamon. Muted, Annie. And this is a first for me. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Annie Kutcher Newton, or Annie Kutzer Newton. I'm a psychotherapist working at Northern Virginia Family Service, or NVFS, uh, also a member of RRCT. At NVFS, I have the privilege of working with torture survivors who are served under the program for survivors of torture and severe trauma, or what we call PSTT. For over two years, I have worked closely with Andrea, uh, this collaboration has been incredibly valuable to the work that I do, but much more importantly to the survivors that we are working with. For years in my work as a psychotherapist, I have witnessed the heartache and anxiety that clients waiting for their asylum interviews experience. Um, they are in asylum limbo. As Andrea explained, uh, you know, a lot of them have filed for asylum. Uh, within a year of entering the U.S. after they fled their country, and now after five, six, or even seven or eight years, they're still waiting with no end in sight. Um, so the enormous backlog at USCIS it has ballooned to over 800,000 pending cases. 
So we see that firsthand as a, psych a psychotherapist working with these clients. So witnessing my clients deteriorating mental health due to the extensive weight made me feel helpless week after week. Therapy focused on symptom management without mm -hmm. being able to take an active role in making an impactful change on their health. This is when I decided to reach out to Andrea. I wanted to jump into advocacy. But let's backtrack for a minute and delve into our client's arduous journey before discussing the advocacy road. Torture is used to dehumanize and destroy the victim's agency and personality in an effort to reach the perpetrator's goal. In short, the purpose of torture is ultimately to take the victim's control and autonomy away. The recovery of these survivors is dependent on rebuilding hope and that recovery comes mostly after the individual feels safe and secure. Asylum seekers are unable to feel secure and safe until they are essentially granted asylum. As Frank McCord explains, forcing asylum seekers to linger in the purgatory of the asylum procedure objectifies them by depriving them of personal autonomy. Now, the extensive wait for an interview becomes re-traumatizing. The results are a feeling of helplessness, irritability, depression, and in too many cases, thoughts of suicide. Anxiety permeates every area of the life of asylum seekers. The feelings of inadequacy and uselessness and their uncertain prospects create permanent inner turmoil. Separation from their family members is another source of anguish for, for asylum seekers. So they fear for their safety, for their family's safety. They feel powerless by not being able to contribute financially to their family. This leads to guilt and distress. They fled their country for fear of being further tortured and losing their life. Yet, they don't feel safe in their new country. Despite having suffered in their home country, they continue to suffer in their new country without any end in sight. Torture survivors feel powerless after having had their agency or control taken away. They now feel powerless in this asylum process. So this is where advocacy comes into play. We wanna give that control back to survivors. This is also where it can get uncomfortable for therapists. Through our formal training, we are often hesitant to encourage clients to take part in certain projects or programs for fear that our clients will feel forced into it. The power differential is ingrained in us, and we are well, well aware of it when we treat clients. We make every effort not to impose our will or take the lead in the treatment. The reluctance among mental health workers to encourage clients to advocate for larger causes is largely because of that power imbalance and its implications. However, what we too often overlook is that allowing them and encouraging them even to engage in causes can be tremendously healing in their journey to recover. It is giving them their control back. They are empowered by their actions, by their courage. Many of them were activists in their home country, as you will hear from them, and the causes they believed in fueled their fire. They are activists at heart, and that's where they shine again. That is what I have witnessed with clients engaged in advocacy. I will now share the process of working with torture survivors in advocacy. The first step is to identify survivors who may be good candidates to share their story and their hopes for the future. These are clients who have developed crucial trigger and coping skills that help them navigate every day's ups and downs. Ideally, they are no longer symptomatic and or have developed effective self-regulation strategies that would help them throughout the process. Most importantly, they are not currently experiencing suicidal ideation. 
The second step is to approach those survivors while giving them agency over their decision to embark in advocacy, as well as the story they want to share. Once we agree on the time, the survivor and I discuss the campaign and how they want to be a part of it. The survivor writes his or her story, and we go over it together. We practice reading it as they would in front of congressional officials. It's important to reassure them that they have complete control over confidentiality. They can share their real name or keep it anonymous by using a pseudonym. Some feel empowered by giving their name while others prefer to refrain from doing so for fear of retaliation on their family at home or on themselves here. Therapeutic skills will come into play in the readout as well as during the formal meeting and afterwards as we debrief. Skills like actively listening, giving them the space and silence, empathizing, validating and normalizing their thoughts and feelings, honoring their pain, de-escalating, praising them, and reflecting on their journey with them are all skills that will be an asset as they are integrated into advocacy. Clients will feel safe. Their advocacy is impactful in the system at large. The policymakers are visibly touched by the presence and testimonies of the survivors. Rather than words on a paper, they hear the firsthand accounts by people who have lived it, and they are moved to meaningful action. We see that there's traction at the moment in our campaign for affirmative asylum seekers and other torture survivors, and this is because of the courage of the survivors. To testify at congressional meetings is empowering to them. They are taking back control of their life. In IRCT's words, we believe that survivors who can and want to should be the principal agents in their own healing journey, and that their experiences of overcoming often unimaginable hardship can serve to improve rehabilitation services for themselves and others. I truly believe in its message that they encourage for survivors to take ownership of their rehabilitation. Mental health workers can play an essential role in helping survivors take back control of their life. Advocacy helps them get their fighting spirit back and gives them hope. Let's, that, let's help them rebuild hope and recover. Okay, Annie, thank you very, very much. So Annie has to leave. I think she's taking her kids to school, right? <laughs> so, uh, but if anybody has it, everybody else will stay on. But um, if you have questions for Annie, please send them to me and I'll forward them to her and she can get back to you. And Annie, thank you for being such a wonderful partner for these two years. On to many more years. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And I'm not taking my kids to school. I have an important meeting. To oh, okay. <laughs> They're already in school. You would hear them if they were at home. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, okay. Amen, please. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Um, um, thank you, everyone, for this opportunity for IRCT, Lisa, Carmen, and for the great effort and for featuring uh, task model. My name is Ayman Taber. Um, I'm honored to be the executive director for Task International. I'm new to Task, and but um, I'm a survivor uh, from Sudan. And this is where Task is very unique in its model in different ways, in the leadership, in the model for advocacy and survivor in engagement. Um, I will start with my personal story. Um, I was a student leader at Umdurman Ahliya University in Sudan, and I was a human rights activist back in the days. Um, in 1991, when I was uh, active uh, in like engagement in um, student movement and human rights, I was detained with my brothers and cousins from home in 1991. I was tortured for two weeks uh, by agents of the regime of Amr al-Bashir at that time. He was a dictator of Sudan who was uh, later accused by the International Criminal Court, ICC, uh, for crimes against humanity and war crimes and genocide in the Darfur region in Sudan. 
I left Sudan uh, in 1996. I fled to Egypt looking for uh, a safe place where I can live after I've been uh, followed and um, um, harassed by the security services in Sudan. And then um, things didn't go well in Egypt. I have to flee Egypt and I've been um, accepted in a resettlement program in Canada in 2000. This is where I went to Canada as a refugee and I stayed there. I came to the United States in 2012 and I found at that time, it is normal, wherever you go, you ask ferries for organization that they can connect you to the community of survivors or human rights activism. So I looked and it was TUSK. In 2013, I came to the Ferris June Survivors Week at TUSK um, because I heard it was a place that supports survivors in the US. I was always interested in standing up for human rights in my country and for my and for improving the economic situation of the people of Sudan and around the world. I believe in human rights and equality. Uh, while prices were climbing in Sudan and the situation was bad during the, the Bashir uh, era, uh, we were like the loud voice calling for people rights. Um, they were spending all the country's money and fortune fighting against the people in South Sudan at that time before they separated. Um, it was important to me also to spread the knowledge and educate people about human rights, like freedom of speech, not just be um, for a small group of elites in my country. I wanted, I had the hope to make human rights education is part of our education in our schools, uh, universities, and it's something available for everyone. I wanted poor Sudanese people to know they had the rights to speak and to move and they have all the rights, every other person or human they are um, uh, granted. As a torture survivor myself, I realized that speaking out about my experience could help me heal from what I've been through. It was a terrible experience for me. I lost my brother uh, in 2010. Um, due to what he suffered during his six months detention and torture back in Sudan. I understand why is it important for task survivor to testify about what happened to them, about what happening in their country and to the others. It can help them heal. Like just Annie said, it is part of the healing process when you talk about it, when you share it with other and when you connect with other who has been like through what you have, they understand you more. We were just at this conference and we were talking about the physical impact on yourself and me and other survivor. We were thinking all this muscle pain, headaches, it is from what we had, but we never thought about it. This is where you connect and you learn about things and you learn how like you can connect with others and what they are being through. So it's a long healing journey, but to connect to each other and to talk about what happened, it is part of it and it's helping in different ways. This is why I stand as an executive director for TASC and as an advocate for myself, for other survivors to get involved, to open and give the opportunity and make it possible for everyone to come here and trained with Andrea and get involved in different groups to speak about what is happening, to, to prevent more people from being tortured around the world, to stop it, to ban torture globally, to make it something no one can be there to do it to another human. Whenever I speak about my own experience, it reminds me that I have the resilience to overcome what I have been through. So I want the other to do the same. This is why I support the advocacy program and I work with Andrea closely where we can get more survivors uh, at task involved in advocacy. And that I can help also prevent others from suffering like I did, not here or in Africa, but globally. Thank you so much for listening and I appreciate the opportunity. Andrea. Okay, Eamon, thank you so much um, for sharing your own personal story, just like for all the survivors. I know 
I mean, and I talked a little bit about it, about what happened to his brother, and I know how difficult it is for him to talk about it. So thank you. Um, okay, so now we are going to go back. Um, okay, and what we're going to talk about now is um, the how to. How does task and survivors do it? What is what are some of the logistical steps and so forth? What's the process? So we're going to talk about that's the U.S. Capitol. Um, you see at the top picture, and the bottom one is. That is Jacob. You see Jacob on the right uh, with Guya sitting Andrea, in the white shirt. You can do full screen like before oh, if you yeah, would like yeah. to. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. I would not, this would, I want to say to embarrass Carmen that she played a huge role in helping me with this presentation. So, not now that I embarrassed you, Carmen. Um, so, <laughs> okay. So, um, and so when you look at the picture below, you're going to see also the woman wearing the, the kind of gold scarf, that's Eleanor Holmes Norton. She's the delegate from Washington, DC, um, and we're there in her office. So we're gonna talk about, um, let's start off first is recruiting survivors. How do we recruit survivors? So on the left, this is our student East delegation in Congress. And the task survivor with kind of her fingers up is Amal. And Amal is an incredible survivor. She's from Sudan. She's blind. She has uh, two master's degrees. She's now going to go to college here in Washington, DC. She never gives up. She's resilient. Uh, she's amazing. And um, Hajir on the left, the other woman is our board of direct on our board of directors, also from Sudan. So how do we recruit survivors to be advocates? We find out first, what are the issues that they care about and where can we have an impact on US policy? There's different levels of involvement. So for example, we're gonna be organizing um, on June 26 and 27, we'll be holding congressional meetings. There'll be two or three survivors who will be speaking and there could be others who are observing. So for example, we will have one meeting with the Senator's office from Maryland, and we have a lot of survivors from the state of Maryland, which is next to Washington, DC. There'll be only three speaking, could be another three observing. So those people who don't feel comfortable speaking, they can watch what's happening, and maybe in the future, they'll wanna speak also. We also have people who speak at a demonstration like Desire, is one of our leaders in the demonstration. Others will just participate. They don't want to speak. Maybe they will in the future. So that's very important when there's so many different levels of involvement so people can do what they feel comfortable doing. Then I explain what the role of Congress is, the White House, the State Department, in foreign policy and asylum. And of course, I kind of do it in stages. I begin just a few basic facts. Um, and then as we move on, we educate people more about the US government. But this is a partnership. So I'm still learning from the survivors about what's happening in their countries and what their opinions are and what they think we should do with Congress. And I'm going, it's going back and forth. So it's a reciprocal relationship. We also want to let them know that their advocacy makes a difference, that we are aiming, like all advocates, we have a specific goal, like passing House Resolution 128 on Ethiopia. There's a body in the US Congress called the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission. Tom Lantos was the only survivor of the Holocaust. He was Hungarian survivor of the Holocaust, who was a member of Congress. So after he passed away, we have the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission in Congress. It's part of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Charles testified once in front of the Lantos Commission. We've had survivors testify before the Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, I published an article in the Washington Post, another one in the Baltimore Sun, all about these issues. So we want to show them that they can win this battle. Um, 
And so that's why they're going to Congress. It's also, it's an educational experience. It's a healing process, but mostly we're aiming like advocates everywhere. We have a specific goal that we're trying to achieve. Okay. Like advocates everywhere. Okay. Um, so this is about. Whoop. Um, yeah, this is about educating people. I hope I've got this right. Uh, about U.S. the U.S. <laughs> so we want to talk about. I'm hearing some echoes, uh, a little bit in the back, Carmen. Yes, our... yes, I'm trying to mute uh, the people as they come in, uh, but it's just someone is uh, muting all the time. If you could all uh, mute yourself while while you're while I'm there speaking. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we want to, again, you see the photos, you see that's the White House with the fence in the front, and then we have uh, the House Foreign Affairs Committee, so we have the US House of Representatives, and then we have the US Senate. So those are just their symbols. We want whoever is the president, whether it was the former president, we call him number 45. We some of us don't like to say his name. I'm one of those people. Uh, so <laughs> when he was president, we also did our work and we still tried to find allies. Um, and now we have a different president, Joe Biden. We try to find out uh, who's controlling Congress? The Democrats control the U.S. Senate. The Republicans control the House of Representatives. But I'm just going to back up a little one more time, and I want to show you this picture here has two Republican congressmen who are great allies of specifically the Ethiopian community and spoke out against human rights abuses, and they're both Republicans. So we have Republican allies. We try to find allies wherever we can um, in both parties. Uh, who are our adversaries? And our adversaries could be in the Congress. It could be people in the government bureaucracy. It could be people, NGOs that, have, that don't support what we're trying to do. And like all advocates, we want to build and strengthen our relationships with allies. For example, we have a letter that's going to be coming from members of Congress. It should be released next week. And these members are saying that USCIS, the US Asylum Agency, should interview people waiting more than five years for an interview. So I asked one of our survivors who's not with us today, he's a transgender man from Cameroon. He's living in California. He's very, uh, very outspoken, very great advocate. So I said to him, could he please write a letter, an email to some of our big allies in the house saying, thank you for circulating this letter to support the affirmative asylum seekers. And he will write it in his own words. So besides me doing this, I will sometimes try to get survivors themselves to write letters because coming from them, it has a huge impact. So he did that. And then he called me and he said, was that OK? I said, that was great. Um, so that's we always we this would not happen without the survivor testimonies. OK, um, building relationships with survivors. So this is our ongoing communication. So I get to know the survivors. Again, I'm not a social worker. This is a partnership, kind of I'm like a trainer, I would say more. Um, and it's a partnership between them and me. And, um, and that's why it works. So you know, there's a lot of other things that I will talk to them about. It's not only you're gonna go to this congressional meeting and this is what we'd like you to say. Um, I keep up to date with country conditions in their home countries. I learn my information, again, focused on their countries. On June 26 and 27, we'll have delegation about Ethiopia, one about um, Eritrea, uh, one about Sudan, and maybe about Cameroon, depending how many people we get. 
Uh, and so I'm constantly going to learn from them as well as from human rights organizations like Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch. And the media that I'm going to look at will be the media that the policymakers depend on. That's sometimes challenging for the survivors because sometimes they want to share media from their own country, but the focus is what are the policymakers going to look at? And if the policymakers are going to look at the New York Times, the Washington Post, BBC, that is what we have to focus on because the goal is to influence the policymakers on foreign policy toward their countries and asylum policy. So that's a little bit challenging, but generally it just takes a few conversations and people understand that we have to focus on the audience. Just like when you're a public speaker, you have your story, but you have to think who is the audience that you're trying to reach. So our audience could be Congress people, the US State Department, President Biden. Sometimes we speak to student groups. Um, I also always talk to survivors about their current asylum status, their lives after asylum. Sometimes they'll ask me for advice about legal cases. I always say that I'm not a lawyer. I can't give them legal advice, but um, they, should, they need to ask their lawyers about their specific case because we're working on broader policy changes which will affect them. Okay, so this, you will see Charles. Charles, who you're gonna hear from in the white on the left and Feyera. Feyera is on the right. He is now back in Ethiopia. Um, this is them, the two of them testifying before the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission um, in Congress. And obviously these are two people that felt comfortable uh, public testimony. So obviously the three survivors today, uh, Charles, Desire, and Jacob, feel comfortable not wearing a mask, revealing, speaking publicly. We don't have a lot of survivors that are willing to do that. So here's a key example. The picture below, you should see Desire and Alex. Alex is the gay man from Russia waiting seven years for his asylum application, holding the rainbow flag. And they're standing in front of the office of Senator Cory Booker who is a very famous African-American senator, but more important for us is he supports torture survivors and asylum seekers. So they felt comfortable being in the photo, being identified. On the left, you see another photo at the same meeting. That we, we took a picture of those three survivors from their back. And I wanted to let everyone know, they didn't have to ask me, Andrea, please don't take a picture of me from the front because I already knew what their situation is. So I asked them, I said, could you three stand facing the wall so I can take a picture from the back? And that makes them feel more comfortable that they don't have to ask me and feel, oh yeah, I don't want to have my picture taken. I already know them well enough to try to make them feel comfortable that I, we are collect, supporting their privacy above all. So that's a good example, those two photos of, um, and most of our meetings are in private, in a congressional office with the congressional aide, the survivors, the meetings are not recorded, um, and they're private. Sometimes survivors will want a photo just for them. And a few times we can put them on public like we have here. Okay, so here is, Preparing, this is how we prepare for the public testimony. Um, I do what I call deep listening and understanding. And uh, I wanted to tell everyone, I tell everybody, Jacob, I say, putting on my journalist hat. And Jacob once asked me, do I really have a hat? That's a journalist hat. I said, no, that just means I'm asking questions. This is not kind of the way therapists work. It's a combination maybe of kind of the way social workers would work, listening to them, being empathetic, but also asking questions so that we can have a good testimony. Um, 
And then I explain a certain strategy that will work, what, what might will work better. This strategy, this speech will work better with this member of Congress, another one with a different member of Congress. Um, you know, so for example, uh, we have one Eritrean son of Eritrean immigrants. Jacob will be meeting with his office. <clears throat> and I'll explain that he is the son of Eritrean immigrants. We have to get him interested in what's actually happening in Eritrea. And, you know, we just discuss what the best way is to approach that particular congressional office. So then we draft the testimony while listening to the survivor tell the story. This is after I already know the survivor. So I don't say if it's a new survivor, oh, sit down, let me write your story. And I'm gonna be looking at my computer while he's talking. No, we first get to know the person both to prepare for the advocacy and also because I care about them. I want to hear them. I want to hear what happened to them. I'm interested in them. Then we'll they'll tell their story while I'm writing it out, either in person, on Zoom, on the phone. And then I'll send it to them. They will make changes, additions, explanations. It's kind of back and forth. And it's almost like when I've kind of done written speeches for previous bosses I had. I'm trying to make them look good. That's the whole idea. If you're a speechwriter, you make that person look good. And that's what I'm trying to do with survivors. So it's their voice, but we're trying to make them sound as great and as effective as they can. And that works very, very well. And then we do kind of practice public speaking so that when they're going to be reading their testimony or looking at it, it doesn't look like they're looking down at something, you know, with their eyes down. We practice reading a few times so that they feel comfortable with what they're saying. Maybe we'll make a few changes. Maybe they'll add things. Um, but that part is really important so that they feel they're doing a good job. And um, so it's very different, I guess, than just saying, write your own speech and say whatever you want because we want them to feel proud of what they're doing. Okay, so timing the testimony. So the congressional offices give us 30 minutes. If we're not done, they are likely gonna say, oh, I'm really sorry, I have to leave now. So if you have a one o'clock meeting and we're not done by 1.30, it really doesn't matter. They're gonna leave anyway. So. It's very important to time, and everybody knows this um, who's participated, Charles, Jacob, Desire, everybody. Um, so in Congress, if we have two survivors, they'll speak for five minutes or 10 minutes. If we have three survivors, they may speak for four minutes. And I give them a word count. Tommy, we got a little bit of noise in the background. Um, Beta is taking care of that, Andrea. Okay. We'll mute okay. the person. So if someone's going to speak for five minutes, I tell them it's about 800 words. People don't know what does five minutes mean. So I say, okay, we got to make this around 800 words. Or it's a longer testimony. It's going to be 1,500 words. And that's the best way to be able to um, look at, don't, if you can't, and this is not just survivors, this is anybody. Anyone who's going to give any speech anywhere, whether they're a survivor or whether they're the president of the United States, they need to know how many words in how much time. This is just everyone does that. So that works very, very well. Um, and of course, you know, people can go off their speech a little bit, but generally that works well. And it's really important because if we have three survivors in 30 minutes, if two survivors speak too much, the other one won't get a chance because the aide will be walking out after 30 minutes. So this has worked very, very well for us. Um, okay. Planning demonstrations. This is a very good example of the partnership. This is a demonstration in front of the Arlington Asylum Office on the asylum justice issue. And it says, <coughs> President Biden and Secretary Mayorkas. Mayorkas is the head of the US Asylum Agency. 
Torture survivors from Africa matter too. That's Desire's slogan. So you'll meet Desire. He came up with that. And that's why that's a perfect example of the reciprocity. He, his slogan was better than anything I thought about. So we just put it there. And that's the banner that TAS created. And it says, the US Asylum Division has forgotten us. You see some of their signs, some of the signs I made, some of the signs they made. USCIS, we need your help. Torture survivors matter too. There's other ones that say separated from my family for seven years. Another survivor created his own WhatsApp page because he's much better at technology than I am. And he has over a hundred people on his WhatsApp page. So he organizes a lot of the survivors to come to these demonstrations. And I just sign on to his WhatsApp page and sometimes I write messages on it, which um, survivors see, but he's taken the lead in that WhatsApp page. Okay, this is the way the, um, the meetings go. We have four to five people in the task delegation. We need written confirmation from all participants. <coughs> If someone gives me a verbal confirmation, we don't count that. This is extremely important. TASC has to have a good reputation in Congress. We're a very small human rights group. Nobody probably knows how small we are. We can't make a mistake. So I don't want like three survivors to tell me verbally that they'll come to a meeting and one shows up. It will be very embarrassing. So we have to have written confirmation if they're gonna participate. And then we have mandatory training without exception. So if Barack Obama wanted me to come, but he couldn't come to the training, I would say, I'm sorry, President Obama, you have to come to the training. I really would do that, believe it or not, because if they don't go to the training, lots of things can go wrong. People won't know where to go. People will get lost. Problems, things happen. So that's why the training is absolutely mandatory for everyone. Also, the training is where everybody meets ahead of time, the people in their delegation. So if we have five people, we want them all to know each other. We don't want them to meet at a congressional office and just walk in. That would happen if they don't go to the training. They could find out where the meeting is. They'll just show up. They don't know what to say. Can't have that happen. It won't work. So because they go to the training, everyone gets to meet each other. You're going to spend the day getting to know each other. It works really well. My interns, Leo and Chloe, are doing research on the different members of Congress that we're going to meet with. So that um, but when before we go into the meeting, everybody will have a little summary of who this person is, who the member of Congress is. The delegation is the team leader, two or three survivors, maybe a lawyer, a volunteer. And then there could be observers, too. The meeting, as I said, lasts 30 minutes. Sometimes we get an extra 20 minutes, 10 minutes. I explained already about the time allocation. We make sure at the end of the meeting, we get some feedback from the congressional aide. What did they think about the meeting? We want to hear from them. And always, most 99%, they'll say, thank you very much for coming in. I really sympathize with the survivors. I know how difficult this was for you. That's not enough. We don't only want their sympathy. We want to know what they will do about the asylum backlog, about human rights abuses in one of the countries. And sometimes they will follow up and they'll do it. And then there's a thank you note from the team leader, input from survivors. Uh, and then we continue following up after the meeting. And um, we're very proud that this name doesn't mean a lot to anybody except people in the US who follow politics, but the new letter that we're gonna have that's gonna go to the Secretary of Homeland Security is led by a Congressman whose name is Jerry Nadler, who is from New York City, who is a ranking minority member, highest level Democrat from the House Judiciary Committee. If you live in the United States and you follow politics, that's a very, very big deal. So we appreciate that that's going to happen. I would show you the letter, but it's not gonna get released till next week. Um, and then we'll have some survivors from New York City 
because I work with survivors throughout the country. Um, also New York, California, Northern Virginia, and we do this on Zoom. So we will have some of our New York survivors write a letter, a message to the member of Congress thanking him for what he's doing. And challenges. Um, what happens when survivors have a difficult time emotionally when testifying? This happens sometimes, not a lot. What does it happen? So for example, in one of the recent meetings, one of the survivors broke down a little bit. I grabbed his hand, I clasped his hand. I told him to take a minute. It doesn't matter whether it's a congressional office or a public event, it doesn't matter. The survivor is number one. And then he kind of recovered. And then I speak to them afterwards and I say, do you want to continue testifying? I know that this is hard for you. And I leave it up to them. In my own experience, nobody has said they don't want to continue testifying. So that is very important going back to what Annie said. It's not up to me. Oh, I see you suffered. You don't have to testify in the future. No. How did you feel? Do you feel okay? Do you want to continue testifying? Let them decide. And Jacob is going to speak a little bit more to this um, so that you can hear directly from them. Uh, my goal is to leave it up to them. They can make the decision. Um, and so, okay. I think that that's, yeah, that's it. So now for me, so now I am going to um, ask everybody questions. So let's start, Jakob, are you there? There you are. So survivors, please unmute Jakob, Desire and Charles, unmute so you can answer. So let me ask Jacob first, why did you decide to become a survivor advocate with TASC? And why can, is testifying important for you? Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Jacob Hagos. I am from Eritrea. I moved to the United States in on April. 2016, I live in Washington, D.C. I work as instructional aide in Calvin Coolidge High School, Washington, D.C. I work as a supervisor at a parking garage in Georgetown, Northwest Washington, D.C. And on my free time, I work as an interpreter in Amharic and Tigrinya, which are Ethiopian languages. So uh, why did you want to become a survivor advocate, Yakov? Why did you want to testify? Why is that important to you? A good question. So let me answer your question with a question. Who else do we expect to be an advocate other than a torture survivor? So I was tortured because I refused to spy on my customers in Eritrea. I had an internet cafe business back home. So the government asked me to spy on my customers and there was a post on the internet making people were making lines to get bread and water so the government accused me of posting those photos on internet they say that you are making Eritrea look bad. That's so, why. Jacob, Jacob, when you speak, um, when you had a hard time at one of the uh, testimonies, but you wanted to keep testifying, even though it was hard, why did you want to continue testifying, even though that was tough for you? Definitely, Andrea. As you said, it's very hard to, uh, uh, to testify. But if I don't testify, if I don't tell people who should know about my tortures, who else will tell them? 
So it's me. It is the first person that I uh, have to talk about that. Okay, thank you. Desire, let me go. Are you there? Desire? Oh, there you are. Desire, why did you decide you wanted to get involved in advocacy? Well, 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 good morning. Well, good morning. Well, good morning. Well, good morning. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, good. Desire. Um, the main reason why I chose to become an advocate with um, task or an advocate in general is nobody is going to tell my story better than I am. And nobody lived my experiences. They might have lived through some experiences similar to what I went through, but nobody went through my experiences. So I am the better person to tell my story. And in addition to that, what I went through, nobody else should have to go through that. And even what I'm currently going through with the US immigration system is what nobody should have to go through that's why I am doing all I can to prevent this situation from continuing and prevent other people from leaving these same experiences I'm going through. Okay, thank you. And how do you how do you feel, Desire, when you're out there leading a demonstration, speaking to congressional aides? How does it make you feel about what you're doing? Well, it's kind of a bittersweet feeling. Leading these demonstrations gives me, makes me feel empowered because I know I am effectuating change. I am an architect of my own story going forward. I cannot change what happened in the past, but based on the advocacy I'm doing now, I'm changing what my experiences currently are and will be going forward. So. Demo, the, those demonstrations, the activism, it gives me some sense of control, which I haven't had in a very long time. Okay, thank you, Desire. Charles, why did you decide to get involved in advocacy? Muted, Charles, you're muted. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I decided to engage myself in advocacy because I think if you survive from pain and torture, you have gone through a very hard way just because you want to express your opinion, you want to express your freedom of thinking. And from that position where you come out from pain with scars on your body, you can better express it to the world what people go through when they speak the truth to the powers that be. The kind of inhuman treatment that people go through and nobody around the world in different countries and in respective governments ever talked about it. So it is only someone who courageously goes through this and is willingly prepared to inform the world that I'm just an iota of what happens in all those conflict countries and what people go through in detention cells, in prisons, and they get tortured and they die silently. And the world doesn't talk about it. And the government doesn't talk about it. Politicians don't want to talk about it. Stakeholders don't want to know. I think I decided to engage in it because I am the better voice, the voice of the people who suffer in a similar way like myself. And people may not have the means. And I decided to involve myself in advocacy because I think let me be the voice of the voiceless. People are unable to say it. They don't even know how to say it. If I could know how to say it, and I'm saying it in different ways through writing, through advocacy, participating in different conferences, uh, uh, working in partnership with other humanitarian organizations, that would be the best way to inform the world 
what is happening when people go through Chaosho. Okay, I just want to say one thing. Charles is from Southern Cameroons because we did not send bios. I can do that later if people want like one paragraph bio of each of the survivors. So Jacob is from Eritrea, as he said, Desire is from Cameroon and Charles is from Southern Cameroons. Um, okay, so uh, Jacob, how did uh, task preparation for your testimony, how did that go for you? Was that uh, muted, Jacob? Okay, go ahead. Tell us about the preparation. So task staff has been very helpful. They help me organize my ideas and make them presentable. The, the training helps me to structure my ideas and the time frame that I am supposed to uh, present my uh, uh, speech or whatever. So task helps me a lot in doing all these things that uh, I'm supposed to do. Okay, desire, same thing about preparing your testimony. Muted, okay. Preparing my, preparing my testimony with task was like a breeze. It, when you have those ideas in your head, putting them down into words can be challenging and sometimes re-traumatizing. Just having that second ear, somebody to help you look over the, the, the story to see maybe some grammatical errors listen to you and maybe help put some of the ideas or the experiences you've been through into words was definitely um, one of the best gifts we received from TASC because a lot of the survivors ha uh, have challenges with speaking English. Some of them can't even speak or understand English, let alone write it out clearly. So for me, going through that process, it really helped me put my, my, bring my story to life in my own words. Okay, thank you. Charles, same thing, please unmute. Charles. Okay, yeah, how did, tell us about uh, preparing the testimony, how you work with TASC. Um. Preparing my testimony with the help of TAST that I have always considered as uh, an organization that has all the support system needed for any torture survivor to find track in following up with their um, immigration proceedings. Uh, with my case, TAS uh, gave me a lot of orientation because I was coming into a society that was completely new uh, they had to orientate me. And with regards to my asylum story, particularly, um, they helped me uh, prepare me to get to court to talk to the judge. They looked at my testimony and they were able to reorganize the facts. Because a testimony, asking someone, a third party to look at your testimony is not to change the facts because the facts can never be changed but they may just have to help you reorganize it in a way that the judge or any um, legal person may be able to understand your story properly well. So they did that to me. And at the same time, Tass was able to write a support letter by the time that I was to meet the immigration judge. And that support letter with two uh, staff from Tass present in court was really, a, in fact, a it was a great assistance that I received from TAS and have always encouraged TAS to keep doing that to other torture survivors who are waiting, like my brother Desire. In fact, my heart goes for him, but I think it would be well. Well, Yaakov, you want to just say um, for one minute how it helped that you were an advocate when you got your asylum, but just very quickly. Yes, uh, uh, the immigration judge that I uh, uh, appeared, didn't know about Eritrea. So my uh, my testimony uh, helped her know about Eritrea and uh, it helped her to grant me the asylum. Yeah, and what Jacob's lawyer told us is all the activities that he did with TASC when he was explaining what he said, that educated her about Eritrea. 
Um, so basically, all the other thing I do is I write affidavits of support about advocacy. So when it's Desire's turn with his lawyer, his lawyer will contact me and we will write a fabulous affidavit of support for Desire so he will win asylum. Okay, um, I want to stop now because we started a little bit late and leave a few minutes for questions. If anybody has questions for me or for the survivors, um, please let us know. Just unmute and ask your question. If not, we'll keep going with the survivors. Questions? Sometimes it can take a couple of minutes, Andrea, because people are okay. thinking and jotting things down on, on the chat. But if everyone's heard Andrea, you can raise your virtual hand, like I can see Chef Bonnell is doing, or you can type them on the chat. For now, we can see we have one hand up from Chef Bonnell from AJPNV chat. So Chef Bonnell, the floor is yours to ask your question. And then after that, we will be with Shay Laden. Shah, what else did you unmute yourself? Yeah. We can hear you, but we can't hear you well. It's a little bit uh, not very clear and not very loud. So maybe you can go closer to the microphone. Or perhaps? you can put it in the chat comment and you can read it from the chat if you want. Yeah. You're talking about me or the other one? Uh, We're talking about Mr. Chaconel. So Chaconel, we cannot hear you yet. And we think there might be something happening with the microphone because we can hear some voice, but not that's loud that's enough. That's okay. If not, you're very welcome to write it on the chat. Yes, could you hear me now? A little bit better, but if you can come close to the microphone, that would be good. Okay, good. It's okay now? Yeah, when you're close to the screen, that's when it works. Okay, good. For me, it's not a question, but it, for me, it's to add a comment, because I am also a torture survivor. My father used to be tortured by the last uh, regime of Isan Habri from Chad. And uh, I am too a survivor of torture because after uh, uh, funded my organization to support survivor of torture from Isan Habri, I went three times to the jail. But being torture survivor, living in the country where you experience torture and facing the perpetrator is not is a, another challenge for us, uh, human rights advocate and torture survivor engaged for the torture survivor in chat. And being a torture survivor is another experience. Is a lot is another uh, is another word for us torture survivors. I found the organization HPNV 22 years ago. It's standing for right of survival to rehabilitation and to survive to reparation. And I, what I listen to my other colleague, torture survivor, is another challenge, is another uh, life that we are living. And for us in charge, now at EGPMD, we are six survivors who are working for survivors, who are engaged for survivors. And I'm happy to listen to the story of our, my other colleague, torture survivor. And for me, it's not a question, but it's just a comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. For your comment. Thank you. Carmen, you want to pick the next person? Yeah, we have Shay Ladan with her hand up. So please go ahead. Hi. Uh, hi, I'm from Asaf uh, from Israel. Uh, my question is what the minimum of uh, safety conditions you need to be uh, to start uh, doing this kind of advocacy? Because, like we told you, of course, you don't need to be a suicidal and you need to be more secure. But what is the amount of security you need to be so it won't uh, make you go like uh, your state get uh, to get worse because uh, you get close all those things out. So, so I wonder if uh, there's some uh, some kind of uh, I don't know guidelines about that because uh, so, how much so, because some people seem they're okay now, but when you start uh, uh, floating those stuff, uh, it's a bit uh, hard for them. We don't we don't have any uh, list of things or anything like that at all. Um, to be very honest, the social workers in my organization, full transparency, 
sometimes used to want to do that, but the advocacy department, no. We just ask them. We don't make that determination. We don't have a little checklist and decide when they're ready, when they're not ready. It's up to them. This is kind of what we're going to be doing. This is a why you could speak in a congressional meeting. You could be at the demonstration, um, whatever you want. You make, they make the decision. We don't make a little a checklist about what's up to them. And I've been tasked nine years. We've had hundreds mm -hmm. of survivors that have participated and it's worked. So this it's a little bit really different. Good you. Thank you. It's very different. Again, full transparency from the social work model a little bit. Annie, we brought Annie to speak so she can kind of explain how she does this as a social worker. Um, and then I we trained her and she worked with Northern Virginia Family Service. But you know, it's just we get to know them. So I don't like walk up to someone and say, oh yeah. Do you want to speak at some congressional meeting? I get to know them. Who are they? Mm -hmm. For example, here's a great example. And then I'll stop here for another question. Yesterday, we had a survivor come into task from the Tigray province in Ethiopia. Um, and, you know, he doesn't have anything to do because he's waiting to apply for a work permit. We said, oh, we're going to be visiting Congress. Are you interested in coming? And he said, no, no, I don't think so. Not yet. So I said, OK. And then I changed the subject change the subject about maybe we can find a job for him, a, a volunteer work or something like that. Just immediately get off of that subject and go into something else that he wants to do, like a very normal conversation with anybody that we knew he didn't want to do it. Great. Don't make him feel bad. Next subject. And it's worked for us, for hundreds of survivors, that technique. Let them decide. They're smart. A lot of them are much smarter than I am. They're brave, they're courageous, they're incredible human beings. They know, they can decide for themselves. Thank you, Andrea. And I could see that Desiree uh, wanted to respond to this uh, query by Ladan as well. So Desiree, please. Okay. This, sorry, sorry, desire. Desire, yes. Desire, yes. yes. Well, well um, for Shay, to answer your question, what I'm gonna say is, there to me i don't feel like there is a, re, a a qualification to qualify you to be an advocate everybody can be an advocate you can even in your street that old lady that is getting pushed over by another man walking by carelessly you can advocate for that person you don't need a qualification to advocate but when it comes to the, the us being re-traumatized by the experiences we've been through. And like, that is another part of your question. At we task, it was a little too easy for us because they go according to our pace. Like what you're comfortable doing, that's what they encourage you to do. You are not being pushed to say what you don't want to say. If you feel like, okay, this part of my story is what is going to traumatize me, or you feel like, okay, I advocated yesterday and today I'm not in that mental space to be able to advocate, they respect your decision. And at the end of the day, that's all that matters because they're not going to send you to go get traumatized because you want to uh, do advocacy. Thank you very Thank much. You. That's a lot. Thank you. Said it much better than I did. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you, Desire. And I can see we have more hands up, but we also had a comment for a few minutes from a few minutes back in the chat. So I'm gonna read that from Mohammed Sadak, uh, Sadakat, sorry. And he says, How to engage survivors as role models to lead the advocacy campaigns at, at a global level rather than keeping them in a mere activist role. So how to make that leap to from activist and or the role of implementing to actually leading? Who wants to take this? So well, maybe, um, well, I mean, the three people we have here today, Desire, Charles, and um, Jacob, I mean, that's why they're here, because they're among the leaders. And so, it kind of happens. Take yeah, let me just say one quick thing, Charles, and go ahead. I'm just going to give an example right now. We're going to be working on temporary protected status for Eritreans, which means they can't get thrown out of the United States. So Yakov just says to me, oh, I can come and volunteer a task 
as soon as I'm done with my school and I can be a translator. So he's just volunteered because these are part of our ongoing conversations. He's going to come into task after June 22nd <laughs> and just volunteer <laughs> and be like a volunteer helping to organize our Eritrean campaign. So it kind of happens organically. Charles, go ahead. Yes, thank you. C can you just reframe the question one more time, please? How do you become a role model? Like, like, how how can you become from just kind of a task participant to becoming a leader and a role model for other survivors? Um, I, I believe that um, from my experience doing advocacy, where we want people in the world to have their dignity, to have their rights respected. One of the reasons why we continue to have uh, people being tortured around the world. The number of torture survivors increasing day by day. I strongly believe is because torture survivors who are so numerous and they have courageously uh, stand out to condemn what they have gone through and what others are going through in the dark is because these torture survivors have not been given the leadership position. Imagine if a torture survivor was to be a speaker in Congress in the United States. And then the debate on asylum issues, delayance, is going to take a different turn. Imagine in that very Congress, so many members of Congress have gone through torture and they want to pass a resolution. It's going to be an overwhelming vote for that resolution to stop torture, to make immigration proceedings go faster. Many people may not be comfortable to, 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 to accept what I want to say that most of these people in position of authority, Congress, State Department, they have not gone through torture. That is just the bitter truth of it. They hear about torture from torture survivors like most of us, and they go read it. They come and inform them. They have not gone through the pain. I think if they could, there could be uh, some empowerment of torture survivors into a position of authority, I think handling torture is going to be completely different and it was going to be more impactful to the suffering masses in conflict areas around the world, to people who just want to stand out for their rights and they are tortured for that, to people who want to who express themselves the way they want society to be managed, it will be different. So I think torture survivors need to be encouraged, get educated, and given those leadership positions so that they should change what they have gone through. If you ask someone who is in Congress, who wants to, who is running as a candidate into the White House to talk about torture, he's talking about it from an abstract position. If somebody is talking from the, an experienced position, believe me, the world will change. Charles, that's most of those dictators, job. most of those dictators have not gone through torture, but they that's want to it. torture people. If you torture him, he's going to understand the experience of torture. Charles, that's, that's a great, great point. Thank you very much. Next time you go to Congress, I want you to bring that up. Really, excellent point. <laughs> thank you. Okay, Eamon. Um, thank you, Andre. Actually, I was just uh, wanted to add to what Charles just said. The empowerment of the survivor themselves, it is what like can make the experiences different. And imagine like for me as an executive director for TASC, uh, reporting to a board, that has like five or six survivors. They've been elected from a general assembly to the board. You feel like how that voice is strong. On a personal level, it is like how you get engaged in the advocacy uh, process itself. Like you get lucky and have someone like Andrea, an amazing person believe on what they are doing. So they give you the proper training you need accumulating the experience by going for more like testimonies, by going for more like events, that will accumulate the experience where to make you a leader on that because then you can be able to train others and you can recruit more people 
to get involved in the process of like being advocate. So it is a, a whole model connected with each other. Like Charles said, we just fight now another fight where we can empower more survivors to, to take the lead in the process, like uh, with taking role in like being part of the staff that working in this organization, being part of the board, where that training can be possible with different resources. Well, I Thank think you. what we'll do, Charles, I just made a decision. I think on June 26th to 27th, I forget which day you're coming, but at the training in the morning from 9 to 1030, whichever day all you guys are coming, we'll ask you to address for a few minutes exactly what you just said to all the new, you know, the people who are going to be coming to Congress for the first time. We'll ask Jacob and Desire to do the same thing. So you just gave me that idea and I'm implementing it in the little bit of power that I have which isn't that much, but we're going to implement what you just said. <laughs> okay, anybody else? Questions? Okay, I think um, I want to just go to my last, my last slide. Um, here's my last slide, everybody. Oh, wait a minute. We can't open it for a second, Lisa. Open for a second. Can you open it for a second? Okay, here do you, do you want me yeah. to open it? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. for a second. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, here it is. Hold on. There it is. Good luck. Buena suerte and bon chance. That's my last <laughs> slide. <laughs> okay, that's it. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much uh, to TAS team, to the survivors involved, and, and to Annie, who's collaborating with TAS and, and wears a dual role. And particularly, thanks so much for all your work, but also for sharing your lived experience. Um, we hear that it's not easy, and it's a, an act of uh, courage, but also generosity to be willing to share this with people, to spread the word about the human rights violations that are happening across the world, and equally importantly, to, to use your voice in these public platforms, because times are changing, and it's good to bridge this divide, divide between certain professionals and, and survivors that were perhaps there is a big divide in, in expertise, and we're trying to bridge that gap all together to, to put survivors at the center. So thank you so much for being part of that. Um, I just I put have... in my email in the chat, Andrea. Yes, and please. I was about to mention that. So TASC here with us is part of our Survivor Engagement Steering Committee at the RCT, an area of work that we're working on and will continue to work on um, through the, the coming years. If anyone here today has been thinking about how to involve survivors in advocacy and strategy in their organizations, if you want the Survivor Engagement Steering Committee to perhaps share experiences, share some ideas with you, please contact us. You can contact Andrea. You muted, muted, Carmen. You can also contact myself uh, and Andrea. My details are on the chat. And lastly, uh, there's two more things. Uh, well, one more thing before the survey. As some of you might know, uh, we we work with a torture journal and there's gonna be survivor engagement articles coming up. The initial date was June, but it looks like it's gonna be on July. So we have a special section on survivor engagement and we encourage you to keep an eye on that. Uh, and with that, I left, uh, there is some final remarks from Elisa, Andrea, or any of you, if you want to say. Um, and then after that, we'll go into the pop-up survey, which will take a couple of seconds. I would just like to thank um, TAS uh, really incredibly. This is a member initiative, and I think you're really showing the way and to encourage others to use this model. It's been a very effective model. I'm sure Andrea is more than willing to share the model with you. Um, the slides will be available on FABO. Um, and uh, this is the learning that you can take with you. So if you want to implement this model or parts of it, you know where to go uh, to share with other members. And, uh, and Andrea and her team at TAS, I hope, would be willing to support you if you wanted to move in that journey. So thanks very much. Time for the survey.
I'll launch it now. Please let me know if you can see it on your screen. Yes. So again, this survey helps us to keep improving these spaces. I'm also gonna put in the chat the link to the Turtle Journal and hopefully the special section will be um, published uh, hopefully at the end of June, but as Carmen said, uh, probably at the beginning of July. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time to complete in the survey before you leave. So we're just here waiting until the survey is completed. And Berta has kindly put a link to the special section on survivor engagement so that you can find these articles on this topic at the end of this month or the beginning of the next one. Thanks so much to all of them, to all of the people that have been here today. Thanks you for completing the survey. Okay. Oh, thanks for clapping, Chavonel. We love uh, Yes. Uh, Bye, fantastic. Looks like a Thank celebration. You. Bye bye. And happy June 26 for all of us out happy there. June we'll oh, celebrate bye, survivors. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank it was great so to much. be with you. It was great. Yes. Bye, Chavonel. Angel, adios. 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 Gracias. Adiós, chutalo. Chutalo. Hi, hi, Lisa. Bye. Hey, Mohammed. Hello. Mohammed, good to see you here. I hope you got some learning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got learning and we posted the question.